and Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Sharon, uh, back in Pennsylvania, uh, not the church we were in, but another church nearby, every year had a penny offering. I forget the, the reason they did it. It was in memory of somebody, I think. But, but they did a penny offering, and everybody would bring in pennies. But not just one penny. They'd bring in jars of jars, and they'd line the whole front filled with pennies. Where they got that many pennies, and oh, I, I pity the bank after they turned all those pennies in. But they would raise a great amount of money through pennies. People would save up with pennies. <laughs> But uh, as, as each of us gives us, led by the Lord, God can uh, raise the funds we need. And God has provided for us wonderfully this year. Titus 1. Uh, Titus is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to one of his young uh, men, mentees, his protégés, a young Greek man named Titus. And we're going to be looking at this book over the next several weeks together, learning the lessons God has for us sit down in this book. And this morning I want to read the first five verses. I'll be reading out of the NIV. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And we'll stop there this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us in your word this book of Titus. It's a book we often uh, don't turn to a lot, and a book we don't think about a lot. <coughs> but a book that as we go through it together, we'll see has a lot of meaning for us in our lives today. And I pray that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit about what you'd have us to gain from your word. We ask in Jesus' name. We start this book and we see the author signs his name at the front end. When we write a letter, we always put dear so-and-so and we go through the letter and we end, you know, sincerely, and we sign our name. In the first century, they would actually put their closing, their, their salutation at the front end. And so that's what we see here today. Uh, when our, person would get a letter, they see right away who it's from, and they know, is this something we need to urgently read right away, or is this something to put down in the stack, you know? In our age today, we get so much junk mail, and, uh, and every day, the mailman puts several letters in our mailbox, but, you know, the phrase Ron and I will say, any real mail today? And, you know, we look at the return address to see, is this something I want to open, or something just to rip up and throw in the trash? So Paul starts out, puts his name, his greeting right at the front end of the letter. So this is a book written by the Apostle Paul. Who is Paul? We know from our experiences in church, growing up in Sunday school, from past Bible studies, from reading, that Paul was not one of the twelve disciples. Uh, so many times, if, if we would do a poll, most people would probably put Paul as, you know, say, name the twelve disciples. Number one, they probably couldn't name all 12. You know, just, I won't ask for a show of hands, but they, can you name 12 disciples? You think, well, I can name three of them. <laughs> but most people would probably throw Paul in there as one of the 12 disciples. He was not one of the 12 disciples. He became a Christian after Jesus died, rose again, and ascended back to heaven. And we find as we read through the book of Acts that Paul used to be called Saul. He was a Jewish man. Pharisee of the Pharisees, very strict, very devout. And he was so upset about these Christians who had broken off from Judaism that he went around gathering them up and putting them to death. 
He was converted on one of these trips. Christ spoke to him from heaven. Fascinating story. If you're not familiar with it, read it in the book of Acts. Uh, I want to say it's about Acts uh, chapter 9, I believe. Uh, God, Christ spoke to him from heaven. He is wonderfully converted. He then goes out and he spends a couple of years out in Arabia and is personally taught by Christ. See, I don't see that in the book of Acts, Galatians 1. Uh, he is personally taught by Christ himself. And then he comes back and he starts traveling around, sharing his conversion story, the good news of the gospel, and starting churches wherever he goes. Paul gives his qualifications of his, uh, his you know, in our day, his, the letters after his name. In Philippians 3, he says, he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. So, you know, he's a good Jew, as Jewish as you get, of the tribe of Benjamin, which the first king, Saul, is from the tribe of Benjamin. So he's from a royal tribe. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. He's saying, I'm as Hebrew as it gets. I'm as Jewish as it gets. As touching the law of Pharisee. The Bible tells us in Matthew, the, the Pharisees will go out through their herb garden, they count through their herbs, and they pull every tenth one to give as an offering. They were so meticulous about keeping the law. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He would say, I was so passionate about serving God, I'd go out and rather than kill Achilles Christians. Touching the righteousness which is in the law of blameless. He says, nobody could have pointed a finger at me and, and showed me sin. Did he have sin? Yes, he did, but... His sin wasn't evident. He said, you know, when it comes to keeping the law, I, I, I did it all. And when we read through that and say, you know, boy, well, I can never be a Paul. I can never look like that. It's sort of like in our day being a Billy Graham. It says, who can be a Billy Graham? Oh, you know, <laughs> there's only one Billy Graham. I can never be a Billy Graham. But as we read on in Philippians, <coughs> after Paul gives that list, Notice what he says next. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. So crude question here, but do you know what dumb is? He says, I count them but dumb. It comes out of the back end of a cow. You probably stepped in some. <laughs> in farmer's fields before. When we look at someone that, like Paul, we say, you know, there is a gifted man. Boy, there's somebody that God could really use. Well, Paul says, you know what? All these credentials, that's what the word I was looking for earlier, all these credentials I have are nothing. They're like manure. He says, what I really care about, what's really important, is my relationship with Christ. There's a, uh, uh, it's actually a sociology professor out in Pennsylvania named Tony Kempolt, and he has a sermon called A Title or a Testimony. And he goes through the scriptures, he'll say, you know, Pharaoh had the title, but Moses had the testimony. And he goes through scripture. And so many times we get caught up on ability. Are we a gifted individual? Do, you know, do we rise to the top? Are we the cream of the crop? You say, well, you look at Paul, yeah, he was. He was the Berlin brand of his day. But he says, you know what? All these titles mean nothing. What's really important is relationship with Christ. As we think today, the question isn't how gifted am I, how, how, how smart of an individual or how great of a talker am I. Ability is not as important as availability. And you might look around today and say, you know what, I, I'm not as gifted as some people. The question is, are we available to God? Are we available to God? Say, you know, I can never be a Paul. But God doesn't want us to be a Paul. We, we, we need to be just as available as Paul was. But he wants us to be who we are. Harry needs to say, I want to be the best Harry Burdick I can be. Sean needs to say, I need to be the best Sean I can be. We don't need to try to be like somebody else. 
We just need to be the person that God has created us to be. Availability is so much more important than ability. Because there are a lot of able people in life who accomplish nothing. Some people are sidelined because of some sin or habit that they hold on to dearly and as a result of it, they ruin any chance to accomplish anything. Some people are so lazy or apathetic that they never give the extra effort that would bring about great results. There are many gifted, able people who go throughout through life accomplishing little. Ecclesiastes 10 says, if the axe, if the axe, <laughs> if the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. Some people are like dull axes. They may not have as much ability, but if they stick with it, they can see great success in life. If we make ourselves available to God, He is the one who gives us everything we need to accomplish the purposes He has for us in our life. It's the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God that is going to accomplish something. We so often think it's our wisdom, it's our smarts, it's our good looks, it's our personality. No. All those things are meaningless. It is our availability to God in the relationship with Christ. And God then will give us everything we need. Ephesians 3.20 says that uh, God can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us. So this is a letter from Paul. Can we be a Paul? No. There's only ever one Paul. But we can accomplish just as great of works for God as Paul did when we make ourselves available to God. Will we do the same things Paul did? No. But we can do just as great as works as Paul when we make ourselves available. So how does Paul view himself? He uses two key words here for us in these verses to consider. A servant and an apostle. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So what is a servant? The word is literally the word for a slave. Somebody who is bound in service to another. Think Uncle Tom's cat. Think slaves on the plantation. Paul says, you know what? All my credentials, they're meaningless because I'm a slave. I'm a slave to God. And he says, secondly, he's an apostle. The word literally means someone who is sent on a mission. Think Hillary Clinton, Condoleezza Rice, generation earlier, Henry Kissinger. The person who goes and represents the country. Paul knew that God had a job for him to do. He was sent on a mission for God. Paul's specific calling was to go to the Gentiles. Uh, more specifically, he felt a calling to go where the gospel had not yet been preached. Peter was given a calling to go to the Jews and uh, had a ministry to the Jews. James had a calling to go to work to lead the church in Jerusalem. Each Christian has a unique calling. But we understand that there's something that God wants each one of us to do for him. There's someone each one of us can reach for God. Paul writes in Romans 10, says, Anyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they have never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless someone tells them? As we go through this book of Titus for the next couple of weeks, we will see that God has prepared a wonderful salvation for us. It is offered freely, it's offered by grace, it's not by our works, not by works of righteousness. It's something for everyone. But we have the responsibility to tell others. A calling by God to share with others what He has done. Just as we think about 
Paul being sent on a mission, there were some people that Paul could reach that Peter would never reach or that James would never reach. But there are some people here in Owasso or Chesedin or Oakley or Crum that they, they may have had other people share with them and witness to them and they haven't responded. But God has uniquely prepared us to share with them. As we think about God's calling in our life, who is it that God has placed into our life that we could share with? So, God has a calling. Paul <laughs> understands he is on a mission. He has been given a calling by God. And he goes on in verse 1 to explain his calling more fully. <clears throat> he says, Paul, a servant of God, he's got a slave, an apostle. He's sent on a mission. Apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Paul says there were two main reasons he was sent. First was to bring the elect to faith. He ties together the ideas of election and faith and brings them together. What is election? Election is the idea that God has elected, God has chosen, God has predetermined who gets salvation. Who will get to heaven? Who will be saved and who will be damned? Do we understand that? No, we don't. Anybody who tells you they do is a liar. Theologians, the greatest minds in the church for thousands of years have tried to figure it, figure it out and have failed. We, have, we come up with theology, our systems of trying to understand God's word, and we can say, oh yeah, we understand this and this and this. When it comes to election, we can make our best guesses. But, is it true? Yes, it is. Does God choose who is saved and who is damned? Yes, he does. But do we have a choice? Yes, we do. How does that fit together? God will explain it to us one day. But we know that both are true. God is the one who chooses, but we have a choice to make. And both are true. Both are in Scripture. Some on the Calvinistic side, Reformed theology, say only the elect can be saved. And some would go so far as to say, we don't need to witness to anybody, we don't need to tell anybody the plan of salvation, because you know, it doesn't matter what they do, they're elect, they're going to go to heaven. Is that true? It's heresy to say we don't need to share the gospel because we already saw in Romans 10 that it's only by the gospel, by sharing the gospel, people hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, that they are saved. I believe one of the best explanations of election is from a Bible teacher from a generation ago. His name was Harry Ironside. And he said, picture if you would, standing outside outside the wall and the gates of heaven. And there you see a great big wall and a great big gateway. And over top it says, whosoever will may come. And you walk through that gateway into heaven. And as you turn around and look in the back side, it says, predestined from the foundation of the world. Can the two go hand in hand? Yes, they can. Somehow it seems that the election is tied together with faith. And Paul says his calling is for the faith of the elect. He said, you know that whole gateway thing, that's a little simplistic. Maybe it is. God will explain it to us. But we understand that faith and election go hand in hand. And so Paul said his calling was to give faith to the elect. Secondly, he says his calling was to give people the knowledge of the truth. Paul taught people to trust and he taught them to turn to follow God's way. First of all, he taught faith. Trust Jesus. And then when you do, you will turn to follow God. The knowledge of the truth. When we know the truth, we will trust God. We will follow God. We will do things this way. Paul says the knowledge of the truth leads to Godliness. We've discovered a link between smoking and cancer. And if you want to have cancer, smoke cigarettes. We've discovered a link between unprotected sex and AIDS. And if you want to have AIDS, have unprotected sex with multiple partners sooner or later. <coughs> you're going to catch some type of transmitted disease. We've discovered a link between alcohol and drug abuse and birth defects. 
And if you want your child to have fetal alcohol syndrome, abuse your body on drugs while you're pregnant. But we understand that when we know the truth, the truth leads us to make choices in life to avoid the consequences. We change our actions because we want to avoid the consequences. Same thing about Scripture. When we know the truth of Scripture, that causes us to say, you know what? God is right. And I need to live my life according to what God says is true. Hollywood tells us lies. You watch movies and they'll say, you know, spice up your life, have multiple affairs. Don't be faithful to one partner. Have multiple partners and live it up. But it's a lie. John 8, 32. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. When we understand God knows best, his truth is applicable to our lives. When we know the truth, we will want to follow the truth. So Paul's mission was to teach people to trust and to turn, and that gives hope. If we look at verse 2, he says, A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. So what is hope? Hope is the confident expectation based on the character of God. It's not just wishful thinking. It's not just saying, oh, I hope things turn out well. I hope I get to heaven someday. If you ask most people, are you going to heaven? They say, oh, I hope so. But hope is rather confident expectation based upon what God says. If God says it, it's true. When we trust in God for salvation, when we follow God, we have hope for eternal life. We know that it is coming. How do we know it? Because God promised us it was true. It says that God promised it. God promised us before the beginning of time. Now how can that be? How can anything exist before time? Our human minds don't understand that. But we understand what is true is that God existed before time. God is eternal. God always has been and always will be. And from all, before God created the worlds, he understood that we would sin. That his plan for the world would end up in man rejecting being faithful. Did it surprise God? No. He knew it even before he spoke the words and created the earth. Revelation 13 8 calls Jesus the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He didn't die until man had lived for thousands of years. But before Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and six days of creation, before any of that, God knew man's going to sin. Jesus dying on the cross wasn't a plan B. God knew from the start that he would have to give his son. Our sin did not surprise God. And our hope of eternal life comes from the promise of God. And notice it says here that God does not lie. We'll see in future weeks that the Cretans, the people who lived on the island of Crete, did lie. They were chronic liars. Uh, they were notorious liars. Kim Cohn sent me an email this weekend. In there he talked about how uh, the corruption of some of the Fulani when it comes to stealing things. And how they, they knew it virtuous. Well, the people who lived on Crete, they thought it was wonderful to lie. That, that was their lifestyle. So Paul, as he's writing to Titus in the church in Crete, he says, you know what? Our God never lies. Our God can be trusted. And the promise of eternal life comes because God can't lie. And therefore, we have hope of spending eternity with God. The second thing that gives us hope, the promise of God, and secondly, the preaching of Paul. Paul says that he was sent at the appointed season to bring God's truth to light through his preaching. So Paul, this great leader of the church, writes to Titus, and in verse 4 he says to Titus, My true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Savior. So who is this Titus? 
Uh, Titus is probably from Antioch in Syria, where Paul and Barnabas began their missionary work. Uh, he was a convert of Paul. Titus 1 4 says, My true son. <coughs> Paul discipled Titus and uh, mentored him in the faith. He probably wasn't as shy and withdrawn as Timothy was. He seems to have been in better physical health than Timothy. He's a companion of Paul. He travels with Paul. In Acts, we see he goes down to the Jerusalem Council and agrees that the Gentiles don't have to keep the Mosaic Law. He was confident of Paul in 2 Corinthians. We see that he is entrusted to go and gather the collection and bring that back. He's a man of conviction. Uh, Galatians 2 says, Yet even Titus who was with me, yet not even Titus who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was in Greek. He didn't give in to just going along with the crowd and doing what other people wanted. He was a man of conviction. He was a man of comfort to Paul. Uh, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7, But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. Titus had a caring heart. We see in 2 Corinthians 8, it says, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. So Paul sees in Titus, here is a gifted young man, a man who loves God, a man who is faithful to God, a man who has served with me. And Paul sees in Titus the ability to be a troubleshooter. As Paul and Titus had traveled together, they had come to the island of Crete. And when it was time for Paul to go, he left Titus behind to finish up the loose ends. In verse 5 it says, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I did. <coughs> so Titus is on the island of Crete. To review geography, if your geography isn't real good, Crete is an island in the Mediterranean, south of the big Greek peninsula. It is 160 miles long, it's 37 miles wide. It was a Roman province. There were at least 100 uh, key cities on the island back in the first century. It's very heavily populated, very independent. To be known as a Cretan, to be from Crete, was not a good thing in the first century. Uh, here in Titus chapter 1, verse 12, it uh, says these people were always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. And that's not just Paul saying that. That was uh, Epimenides, one of the Greek philosophers, said, oh, those people of Crete, they're horrible. So, the, the Cretans were steeped in false religion and pagan superstition. They believed that Zeus, the key Greek god, was from the island of Crete and was born under mountains. On this large island, the gospel had come and many lives had been changed. <coughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 11, tells us that there were people from Crete present on the day of Pentecost. <coughs> So Peter, in Acts 2, stands up and preaches. Jesus is the promised Messiah. Salvation is found in Jesus. And people from Crete are present. They take the gospel back to Crete. And a church is formed in Crete. Uh, Paul has actually visited the island uh, a couple times on his travels. And so now as he and Titus come, Paul has to leave. But he leaves Titus there to finish the work. The word in verse 5, straighten out, is the word from which we get the orthodontist, or orthopedist. It has the idea of uh, to set right, to set in order. It was used by medical doctors in the day to talk about setting a broken bone so that it will be right and will heal correctly. Like a doctor, the task of Titus was to straighten out the problems in grief. So what was the problem? You say, well, you know, there's all kinds of heresy out there in the first century. The problem was a lack of leadership. The church needed leaders. In, in all these towns, we think, oh, you know, what's the problem? They have one church and everybody can drive and go wherever they want. No, they didn't have cars back then. People walked, rode a donkey. Every, of these hundred cities, each of them would have a church in each town. And there was a need for leaders. Titus is given instructions by Paul to appoint elders in every town. So what is an elder? <clears throat> we'll talk more about that next week. But uh, in the Bible, we see several terms all referring to the same thing. Elders, overseers, bishops, rulers. They all refer to spiritually mature men who take the lead in the church. Next week, we're going to look at some uh, qualifications of leaders. What should leaders look like? Uh, but finish up today, the question is, how does a person become an elder? <clears throat> yes, Titus was to go around and appoint them, but where does he find them? 
Where does he find the elders? They were, men were chosen based on their qualifications. But here again, the, the key idea is, this is not just a question of ability, but available. Making ourselves available to God and letting God grow us. When we look at the qualities of leaders in Titus, we understand we should each strive to have these qualities in our life. When Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, he says, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Where do the leaders come from? They come from within the church. We're not to go around looking for some super saints who can come to the church and lead the church. But rather, we need to pass on the truth that God has taught us to others within the church. And we need to find people who are willing to learn and to grow. As a Christian, we should constantly be striving to learn more about God, to be more faithful to God, that, to see God working and changing us to be more like God. That's why we have some of the programs we do, the, the, the ladies' Bible study, the men's Bible study, the, the book of the month club. These are opportunities to get in God's word and say, how does God's word apply to me? How can it help me grow? How can I be more like Christ? The church needs leaders. But those leaders will only come when we make the choice and make ourselves available to God and say, God, I'm available. God, help me to grow. Truth is that we need leaders here at Bethel. But we aren't going to uh, just pray that God brings us the leaders. God, we need somebody to come and be a leader to us. No, God's design is that the next set of leaders, the next generation of leaders will come from within us. As we make ourselves available to God. And we say, God, change me, mold me, make me what you want me to be. God, here I am. Use me. Sadly, too many Christians take themselves out of commission and say, I'm not available. God, find somebody else. I'm too busy. I don't got what it takes. God, I'm not available. Pick somebody else. Or they say, God, I'm available as is. You want to use me, God, here I am, but hey, take me or leave me. I'm not changing. God's desire is for us to make ourselves available and say, God, make me what you want me to be. When God points a finger at us through the Holy Spirit and says, you know what? You've got some problems with your speech. We don't just say, like one man told me, in our church in Fort Wayne. Well, I just got a temper and I say things and that's just the way I am. People need to learn to live with it. No. Whatever God tells us, we need to say, you know what, God, you're right. I want to change that. Because that's not God. I'm going to work on control of my speech or my temper or my pride or my generosity or my faith or my prayer life. That when we say, God, I'm available for you to use, make me what you want me to be, we're also saying, God, I want to grow. I want to grow spiritually. I want to become spiritually mature. I want the fruit of the Spirit to be seen in my life. Yes, we love all people. And we don't want to say, oh, we don't want so-and-so to come here because you, know, you should see the sins in their life. No, we are glad that, that each person is here today. Don't look around and say, boy, you know, somebody's got potential, but they don't. The other person doesn't. No. Every person here has potential for spiritual growth. But it starts by making the choice. So the question is, are we willing to prepare to be all that God wants us to be? Just like Paul. God has a mission for us, a purpose for us, something he wants us to do for him. Just like the church in Greek, Bethel needs leaders. But are you available? Are you willing 
for God, not just to use you as you are, but to change you and grow you so that you grow spiritually mature. Say, well, I'm already pretty good. Each of us still has areas to work on. If you don't believe it, just ask your spouse. They'll point out some areas to work on. Story is told of a farmer who took an eagle's egg and he placed it in the chicken coop. The eagle chick was hatched by a chicken in the barnyard. It was raised with other chickens, scratching the dirt and pecking at bugs. And one day that eagle looked overhead and saw an eagle soaring way up in the sky. Something stirred in his heart and it took off the sword of the skies as well. The problem with the eagle wasn't, wasn't that everyone else thought he was a chicken. The real problem was that he thought he was a chicken. Something like that has happened to many of us. We fail to see what could happen in our lives. We fail to believe that God could do something great with us. Many times it's easy to come out to church and say, oh, I'm just going to come to worship, but, you know, there's nothing for me to do in the church. God can't use me to do anything. I'm no Paul. I'm no Billy Graham. I'm no pastor. I can't do that stuff. And we write ourselves off. Do you want to soar with eagles or do you want to scratch with chickens? Today, believe that if you will make yourself available to God, and if you are willing to grow, that God can help you grow spiritually. That God can help you become spiritually mature. Because that is God's desire for us. And the truth is that that will need you. Bethel needs you to develop the gifts that God will build within you as you make yourself available to God. Let's pray together. Father, sometimes we believe the lie of Satan that we're worthless, that we're no good, that there's not really much that we can do. But as you tell us the truth, the truth will set us free. Father, we want to believe the truth that you've given us everything we need for life and God. We believe the truth that uh, the Holy Spirit will gift us and empower us for ministry. Lord, we understand it's that your, your word that teaches us and helps us to grow, that helps us discern right from wrong. And Lord, this morning, we don't want to be just like the chickens in the barn. We want to believe that you want us to serve. Help us, Lord, to first of all make the choice to make ourselves available. Just like Paul did. Just like Titus did. Lord, help us to say, Lord, here I am. Use me. But help us also to trust you, your Holy Spirit and respond to your Spirit to, to see you help us grow. We understand growth doesn't just happen. It comes as we take time to study and to apply what your Spirit speaks to us about. And Father, I pray that we would have a desire and commitment to grow spiritually in our lives. And Father, I pray that as we continue through this book of Titus, that you would continue to help us to see how you can use us and what you desire to do in our lives. Father, thank you for what we've seen here in these first few verses. Use us, we pray, for your ministry, for your purposes. We ask in Jesus' name.